So as I mentioned just a moment ago, we finished this annual summer series comprised entirely of questions that you asked, entitled, What's Up With That? I told you last week that three of you this year asked me something about the broader subject of something that Christians call Jesus' second coming, or His return to earth. And what I wanted to do is, instead of talking about that broad subject, I picked two of the three specific questions that you asked me, and we're going to spend our two weeks talking about the second coming of Jesus, focused on those two questions. If you missed last week, here was the question that somebody asked. And it is, frankly, an often overlooked question when you talk about what the Bible says about the end times or Jesus' return, but from my vantage point, it may well be the most important. We spent our time talking about that last week. If you missed it, you can get it online, you can get it at the CD rack. I I do want to share something that I found that I didn't have time to include last week, just because you can't laugh enough in church. Um, I found a couple of lists online that were the top ten reasons why Jesus has not come back yet. And I kind of put them together, threw out all the stuff that I didn't think was funny, and I give you the top seven reasons why Jesus has not come back yet. Heaven just got cable. Number two, like you, he's afraid to travel to the Middle East. Number three, the universe is a big place. He can't remember what planet we're on. Number four, he doesn't speak English. Which, by the way, is true. He didn't speak English. Number five, he's waiting for long hair to become popular again. Number six, he already has on a tortilla in Mexico. (laughs) My personal favorite. And number seven, because his last visit did not turn out that well. Here's what somebody asked me that we're going to focus on today. Should we interpret biblical prophecy literally or symbolically? Now, you may not think that that has much to do with you or that that's all that interesting, and hopefully over the next 30 minutes I can change your mind a little bit about that. I would tell you this to start with. Most of all those disagreements that you know exist among Christian people about how they conceive of Jesus' second coming or His return to earth, the end times, it actually all goes back to that question. This may well be the question that is the foundational issue of how you will determine how you think about the end times or Jesus' second coming. So, How would you understand biblical prophecy? Biblical prophecy being things like Revelation, the last book in your Bible, Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, things Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 25 about the future, perhaps, about the end times, His second coming. How do you understand it? Is it a literal script? Is it a blueprint? Or is it maybe more symbols or pictures? Now, It's always helpful for those of you who have been around the church block a few times to put yourself in the shoes of a non-Christian. How do you think a non-Christian looks at or perceives that question on the screen? Well, they don't know what to make of it. They can't believe that rational people would believe that some book written between 2,000 and 3,500 years ago would even claim to have things to say about humanity's future. They certainly don't think that Jesus, who may or may not have been a historical figure 2,000 years ago in their mind, is ever going to come back to earth again. So when they evaluate this question for them, it probably seems like nonsense. You see that, right? And it seems to me as a Christian and somebody who by profession and calling is supposed to explain the Christian faith 
as well as I can, not just to insiders, but outsiders, it is now incumbent on me to try to explain this question in a way not that churched people would understand, but that an unchurched person might understand. And that's part of my goal this morning. I think the best way to start is you need to get a taste of what this question is asking about. That is, you need to dive headlong into some biblical prophecy and see why this is an important question and why it is that people have such a hard time wrapping their heads around the subject. What I'm going to do is flash up here on the screen three passages, two from a book in the Bible called Revelation, one from 2 Peter. And I'm not going to read them aloud, but while I'm talking about them, I want you to read them, okay? And I'll be giving you crib notes along the way. This is from Revelation chapter 17. It's from a section in Revelation 17 and 18 about this figure called Babylon. As you read through that, what do you see? What do you take from that? Um, For starters, in my 20s, I read a lot of Hunter S. Thompson. This strikes me as something from fear and loathing in Las Vegas. Drugs may or may not have been involved in the writing of this passage, right? This is weird to us when we read it. The images, the ideas, it's strange. How are we supposed to take this? Hmm. That phrase down there toward the bottom of this first passage is one you'll find common in biblical prophecy where this writer says that I was carried away by God's messenger in the Spirit as if it's some kind of mystical vision that he received, whatever it happens to be. This is the same passage continuing on. What do you see? Well, again, it stays fairly bizarre and weird, right? But you note that the images and the language is very powerful. It brings things to mind. There's even emotion to it. Right? You see that. You have here something described that on the one hand is very powerful, and yet on the other hand is very evil. And apparently the entire world, did you catch it in the first uh, part of the paragraph, the entire world, all the kings of the earth are involved in whatever is being described here. So it's epic and global in scope. If you lived when this was written, which is around 90 AD, you would have had no doubt in your mind that this was talking about one and only one thing, and that was the Roman Empire. And there are some verbal cues that I'm not going to go into great detail about in this passage that would have clued you into that like the seven heads and the ten horns. That doesn't mean anything to us. It would have back then. But then, for that first century reader who thinks this is about Rome, all of a sudden toward the end of this vision that's being recorded, you're told this isn't about Rome. It's about something mysterious called Babylon the Great. And you think, wait, I thought this was about Rome. The great world power of the time. But instead, it's pointing me backward to the Old Testament of my Bible, to an empire that actually twice appears. Hmm, I wonder what that's all about. A couple of chapters later, this is part of how the return of Jesus is described in Revelation 19. Again, I want you to pan through it, and I will give you some crib notes as you do. I have seen, you can Google this, there are artists who have tried to render what's being described here literally. And Jesus' head ends up looking like a coat rack because he has many crowns on his head. I have a size 8 head. I cannot fit into normal hats. His head is apparently bigger because he can wear many crowns at once. How do you take this? Is this literally someday going to be exactly what happens and how it looks? That passage continues with a further description of the arrival of Jesus. And you notice things like, he has something written on his thigh. That's a tattoo. Jesus was Jewish. 
You know what? Jews are not big fans of getting tattoos. Strange. Huh. Is this literal? Or is there something else going on? Do you want to know what some interpreters really struggle with about this description? This doesn't seem like Jesus in the Gospels. This Jesus is mad and belligerent and showing up to kick some you-know-what. That doesn't seem like the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some interpreters wonder aloud. How do you make heads or tails of that? Then here's that example passage from 2 Peter 3 that we'll look at a couple of times today. Again, you have big, grandiose, epic language about the end of the world or the return of Jesus or what's called in Scripture the day of the Lord or the day of God. You have it liked, you catch it here in this first citation, it's described with echoes of the past as if it's a new creation. The world was created at one time, it's going to be created again. There's also echoes of the flood. Way back in Genesis, the world flooded once and what's going to happen will be like a flood again. How on earth do you take it? This is how Christian people have tried to make heads or tails of biblical prophecy like the three passages you just looked at. They tend to break down into four groups. You have people who tend to understand those kinds of passages only about the past. So they would emphasize things like Revelation is really only about the Roman Empire. You have some people who would say biblical prophecy is really about maybe the present, where biblical prophecy is telling you not just about the past, but also how human history itself is going to unfold. Then you have people who focus entirely on the future, that things like Revelation are only about what's yet to come and has not happened yet. Those left-behind books that you may or may not be aware of were about the future, right? They read Revelation literally and about the future. And then you have Christian people who say, really, it's timeless. It's not about when at all. Those passages are just describing things that are spiritually true at any given time. A couple of notes on this. You know which one the newest is? It's the future one. The future one really has only been around for about 150 years. Had a brief appearance early in church history, then totally left the scene. And only started again about 150 years ago. The earliest one is probably the past and the timeless. And the one that's probably been the most prevalent in church history over its 2,000 years is the timeless one. Did you know that? All right, so here's what I don't want to do today. I don't want to convince you to think about this question the way that I do. I don't want you to view biblical prophecy the way that I necessarily do. Because as I just showed you, good Bible-believing Christian people can and do disagree. So I'd like to back up one step, and I'd like to talk about two very important features of reading biblical prophecy, really the Bible in general, that regardless of how you understand biblical prophecy, you need to be aware of, you need to utilize. As Rob Bell used to say, this is really the question or the issue behind the question or the issue. Here are two things that regardless of how you think about prophecy or how you were taught it in your last church, these are two things that every single one of us have to keep in mind about that subject. Okay? Number one. It's actually not most. It's all. All biblical prophecy, that stuff in Revelation, the stuff in Isaiah, the stuff in 2 Peter 3, all of it is poetry. Poetry. Oh, you just got nightmares, flashbacks to junior year high school English. Poetry. Which means that 
its metaphors, its word pictures, its images. And to interpret it right, right, you have to remember that. We therefore have a problem. How many people do you know, when they want to do a little light reading or bedtime reading, snuggle up with Walt Whitman? Ezra Pound. Shakespeare. There's nobody, if I had a show of hands, nobody in the room, other than the biggest nerd in the room, whoever that is, nobody would raise their hand. Okay? Right? Somebody in the second row just raised their hand. Oh, oh, they pointed at me. Nice. Nice. No, I do not read poetry. I am a nerd. I am a nerd. True. We don't live in a culture that really values poetry a whole lot. This kind of metaphorical language, word pictures, whatever, right? You see that. We just don't. Probably the closest thing that we have in our culture is music. Music for you is probably very meaningful and emotional. There are probably favorite songs of yours that you have that will always be your favorite songs because they tap into something very deep and fundamental about life, about your experience. Well, that's how poetry works. Poetry is meant to tap into the timeless mysteries of God, of life, and how we live it. And because we've lost poetry, we tend to have lost an ability to grasp that. The word for poetry is the one that's up there uh, in the rectangle. Poetry is evocative. Do you know that word? Evocative. It evokes something in us, and you can't help it. Poetry, when it's well done, stirs something deep in the human imagination or heart. And you can't stomp it out. It touches on things that are deep and mysterious and timeless. Things that we all wonder about regardless of when we lived. This is what poetry does. And see, the problem here is, because we're not a culture that really cares about poetry a whole lot, or understands it a whole lot, or even reads it a whole lot, because the Bible is by and large poetry, we sometimes have a hard time understanding it, grasping it, hearing it say what it means to say. That little image there up on the screen is how poetry or word pictures work. You're trying to describe something that is vast and mysterious, and you can't do it. So you try to come up with, you cobble together some kind of word picture to help us understand. Your Bible does this all the time. The things that your Bible is dealing with are hard. They're big. They're grand. You can hardly put them to words. And so it tries to find images or word pictures to describe them. Whether it's talking about God or what's wrong with the human race or where human history is going or Jesus himself. It uses a symbol or a word picture to talk about very hard or abstract things in a physical way. Now, here's the thing. Humanity has always done this. Way back in the day when you had the first cavemen, what were they doing? They were drawn on the walls of their caves, trying to represent for one another how they were trying to sort through this hard thing called life. One of the things that is true about being human is that you believe in poetry, whether or not you know it. You as a human being are defined by trying to understand and wrap your head around the very hardest things in life. The most mysterious, the deepest things. And the race that you are a part of has always tried to talk about those things through metaphor, through symbols, through poetry. It has been our language of the human experience, of spiritual experience. To be poetic is really to be human. The Bible then really fits into what it means to be truly human. It is a truly human book in this regard. Um, I want you to look at these verses up on the screen. Now, I'd like you to note something first, okay? There's nothing beautiful about that slide. It is black font on a white page, right? There's nothing extravagant or eye-catching about that. 
And I guarantee you, every funeral you go to, this psalm is going to be read. I suspect that for many of us who have been Christians for a while, or who have been in church for a while, there are very few more beloved passages in the Bible than this one. Why do you think that is? Because it's poetry. That's why. And it's describing something that we really, really care about or want to know about. Something we really, really want to get a hold of or understand. And so the poet here, King David, comes up with some timeless word pictures. What is God like? God is like my shepherd. Oh, I don't know what God's like. God's too big for me. I'm one little human being. I get what a shepherd's like. I've seen shepherds out in the field. I get it. And if God is my good shepherd, then I'm never going to starve. I will not want. He will, lie, he will make sure that I lie down in green pastures. He will take me beside still waters. See, I could stop preaching right now. I'm not. I could stop preaching right now. All i got to do is read those words, and something inside of you goes, Oh, that is awesome. That's poetry, people. Doesn't mean I'm going to read it at night. Doesn't mean you're going to either. But you get it. The power of those words is the image that it invokes. Yes? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. Who on earth can say those words and not feel strength? coming into their bones. That's what poetry is. Concrete, tangible word pictures that tap into the most important things of life. The spiritual part of life. The timeless part of life. The mysterious part of life. That's why you love this passage. Guess what? Biblical prophecy is all, not some, all of it is like this. It doesn't mean that it's not about the future. It doesn't mean it's only about the past. You can come to your decision about that. Here's what I know. It's all like that. It's all poetry. And if you don't appreciate it or understand it like poetry, frankly, you're missing the point. Let me give you an example. Here's that passage from 2 Peter 3 again. What do you see? That's poetic. That's evocative. What do you see? But the day of the Lord, which is the return of Jesus, it is going to come like a thief. Stop. Don't read anymore. If you want to get that, the way that the writer intended it, you have to feel it. You have to imagine it. What's it like when a thief shows up at your house? It's surprising. It's even a little frightening. You cannot anticipate it happening. Jesus' return, whatever that means, however you conceive of that, Jesus' return will be like a thief. And regardless of how much we argue about when that will happen or how that will happen, here's what I want you to know. If you don't feel down to your soul, if you don't feel the force of the word thief and what that means and how it taps into your imagination about how you think about the return of Jesus, then you're missing the point. No matter how right you get the timing. Continue. The day of the Lord is like a thief. Two verses later, Peter says, but in accordance with his, God's promise, we wait for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness is at home. Righteousness. God's justice. Everything that God thinks is right and moral and good. That's what that word means. We look forward to a day when the new, in the new earth and the new heaven, righteousness will be at home. That's poetic language. 
regardless of when you think that will happen or how that will unfold, when you read that sentence, how does it affect you? How do you experience it? Because that's really the point. Um, Is righteousness at home in our world now? Actually, no. Not a bit. As an observer of our world, would you not say that so often it seems like our world and the people in it and the powers that be who are in it seem like they are dead set actually against righteousness? Goodness and love and generosity and justice. It seems to me like God's righteousness is a foreigner in this world. A stranger. The best we can hope for in this world is that those powers that be and the people around us give great lip service to the idea of wanting those things and they never really do. And the reason that I, as a Christian person, do not feel at home in this world just like you is because righteousness is not home in this world. And yet, Peter says, and yet, we look forward to a day when the new heaven and the new earth will be here, whatever that is. And what we know about that place is, it will be a place where God's righteousness is at home. God's righteousness can kick up its feet sit in the rocking chair, drink a little lemonade on the patio. It's at home, finally. Do you feel it? I don't care if you think of how this is going to unfold a little differently than somebody else or what the specifics are. If you're missing the sheer power, the emotional force of that sentence, you're missing the point. Prophecy is meant to be read in an evocative way. Your entire Bible, more than it is anything else, is a book of poetry. It's got history in it. Absolutely. It has teaching in it, like the Proverbs. Absolutely. But you know what the Bible is mostly? Not just biblical prophecy. The Bible as a whole. It's poetry. And if you don't take time to appreciate what it says and see how it affects you, imagine what it's describing, then really you're missing the point. Regardless of the specifics of when it will happen or how it will happen. Now, if that was eye-opening, and I hope it was, uh, I think this will be too. And again, this is applicable for anybody doesn't matter if you think that biblical prophecy is about the future or the past. Whatever box it was that you fell in or you've been taught that I showed you earlier. Here's something you have to know about how the Bible looks at human history. Not just prophecy, the whole thing. The Bible thinks that history repeats itself. And that's why oftentimes in passages like you saw, you see the past and the present and the future blended together or blurred together. Because that's how the Bible understands history. It repeats itself. Now, if you think, okay, that's strange to me. I don't quite grasp that. Well, I'm going to give you some examples in a minute, but back away for a second and understand that this is also a human thing. This is not just a biblical thing. This is a human thing. Uh, Russ Roseman is in his cabin in Canada this week. He's going to miss a sports analogy, unfortunately. When we talk about who the greatest current basketball player in the NBA is, you know how we talk about it? Who's the next Michael Jordan? What are we doing? We're invoking the past to describe the present. When we have arguments about who the greatest quarterback of all time in the NFL was, what do we do? We blur the lines between the past and the present. And we think, oh yeah, Tom Brady. He's the new Joe Montana. Okay, and I'm, I, ladies, I am totally going to stop. Totally. But all the guys get it. Right? We're blurring together the past and the present. We do it with politics. Somebody runs for president, and their party wants you to believe he's the next John F. Kennedy. He's the next Ronald Reagan. What are they doing? They're invoking a 
figure from the past to help you understand the present. You saw it, by the way, in those passages that I showed you earlier. So Revelation 17 and 18 is written, and to its first century readers, they would have gotten the signals from the text that this could only be about one thing. What? Rome. And yet, when Peter gives what he's describing a name, what name does he use? Babylon, from the past. He says, hey, you know in the past, twice in the Old Testament, the great world power that was corrupt and treacherous and tyrannical, that was fighting against all things good and just, twice in the Old Testament it was named Babylon. You know what Rome is? It's the new Babylon. That's how your Bible understands history is that you have these big people or these big things that happen in the past and your Bible knows it's going to happen again. And the Bible knows it's going to happen again. That's, what you, that's why you see so much of the past and the present and the future blended together. Look at 2 Peter 3 again. And I want you to see the past and the present and the future blurred together. This is Peter describing the return of Jesus, or the, what Christians call the end times. What you'll notice as you read through those words is he's using two big events from the past to describe the future. He says, someday God is going to remake the world. Why do we know that? Because he made the world in the first place. The past, in this case the distant past, informing the way we see the future. He also says we know that part of what's going to happen is that God is going to judge. He is going to morally assess the world and its inhabitants. Why do we know that? How do we describe that? Because he did it during the flood of Noah. You see that? He invokes the past to talk about the future. This is how your Bible understands life, history, all of it. Your Bible thinks that history repeats itself. And that when you see big people or big things in the past, odds are you're going to find similar things in the present and you're going to find similar things in the future. Because they just recur over and over. This incidentally ex explains part of what uh, a very interesting phenomenon about biblical prophecy. You know what it is? Over the 2,000 years of church history, every generation of Christian people has always thought biblical prophecy was about them. <laughs> really. You go back to Martin Luther's day in the 1500s, he reads the book of Revelation and goes, my gosh, this is about me. You flash forward 500 years and Christians today look at it and go, wow, this is about me. Well, kind of. What it's really about is the fact that history repeats itself. This, incidentally, is a very powerful concept for how you look at your life. Do you know we do this all the time, trying to live the life of faith? You sit across from somebody and they tell you, man, I am at this point in my life where I feel like God is telling me to do something, and I'm scared because I don't know how it's all going to work out. I just know he's telling me to do it. And then they say to you, I feel like Abraham. Ah, there it is. Exactly. Abraham's this huge figure in the Old Testament that started his relationship with God by God asking him to do a crazy thing, take a massive leap of faith and move to an entirely new place. And for the rest of your Bible, it looks back at Abraham as this extraordinary figure who exercised great trust in God. And look, 2,000 years later, when we think of what it looks like to have faith in God, what do we do? We look to the past and we say, I want to have faith like Abraham, who was gutsy and strong in the face of such uncertainty. Yeah. You need to learn to define your life as history repeating itself. All those things you observe in the Bible, all those people you see, 
all the big events in the Bible, guess what? You're going to experience your own form of them. And by the way, they will in the future too. Maybe it surprises you sometimes. You think, gosh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't quite get it. Why is it that Christians are given such a hard time? It seems like the more that I am vocal about my faith, or the more that I tr try to live out these very hard values that Christians espouse, or that Jesus teaches, the more I take flack for it. Hmm, I wonder when that happened before. How about all of church history? All of it. And in the Bible. It happened all the time. You should not be surprised that it happens to you, because it's just history repeating itself. And it will not change until the end. You see that? This is a powerful way to learn to look at your life. There really is, as Solomon in the Old Testament says, nothing new under the sun. The same big ideas just repeat themselves. The same big events just repeat themselves. It's just the names that change. And this, by the way, is why your Bible can talk about the future. Do you see that? I hope at least for somebody in the room, this is a light bulb moment. That's why your Bible can talk about the future confidently. This is a great Dutch Christian writer who is probably most known in the 20th century for working with her family to hide Jews in Holland from Nazi persecution during World War II. But note the concept. We never are afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. See, we look at the future and we think, gosh, we don't understand at all how this is going to work out. How can anyone look past the veil of tomorrow and see anything with certainty? Actually, you can. Because at the very least, we know that God will always be the person who acts the same, who values the same things, who detests the same things who will act toward us and other people in the same way. Here's what I know about my present. Here's what I know about your present. There are things, there are, they happen to be things that I know from the biblical past. I know that God really wants me to trust him more than I can make sense out of my life. I know that to him he thinks that loving him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving my neighbor as myself are the two most important things anybody could ever do in their life. This is true of my life. You know what's true of the future? The same things. Why? Because God doesn't change. The Bible can predict the future because history repeats itself and God does not change. And so God responds to injustice in the same way in the future that he does in the past. It should not surprise us that if in the future there is some future world power as described in Revelation 17 and 18, it should not surprise us that God will not like it because God never liked it. Do you see that? It should not be that mysterious about why it is the Bible can be so confident sometimes speaking about the future. It's because it's so confident that it's just a repetition of the past. And that God alone is the continuity between all times. So, here's what you learned today about how biblical prophecy actually works. Regardless of how you want to think of the specifics, let's not get bogged down in details. These are two things that regardless of who you are or what your vantage point happens to be, you need to take into account at all times when you check out biblical prophecy, but frankly, this is true of the Bible at large as a whole. Those two ideas should be familiar to you from what I presented today. But see, you can tell this is bigger, this is wider than just biblical prophecy. There's a lot of meat here or grist here for you as a Christian person in general. How are you going to interact with the Scripture? How are you going to listen to it? How are you going to be informed by it? Well, it needs to be like number one, right? And too often we don't treat the Scriptures that way. Ah,
but maybe even more illuminating, when you look at your life and you try to understand what's going on or where it's headed or how on earth you can have any certainty for the future, it actually needs to be the same way that we talked about in terms of interpreting prophecy. And see, the Bible thinks that your life is not unlike every other life that's lived. And that in your life, you're going to experience the same things that the great figures of the Bible did. You will experience in some form the great events of the Scripture. We know this. You need to see your life as part of history repeating itself. You should not be surprised by what happens to you. It's already happened before. And you should have great confidence in the future. Why? Because I don't know what your tomorrow is. I don't know what your next decade looks like. But I do know what the God who will be with you is like. And he does not change. And he will treat you and look at you and be kind to you in the same way then that he is now. And that is truly the only confidence that any of us have about tomorrow or the next 10 years. Would you take a moment in the quiet and maybe talk to God about what it is that you heard today? Give Him a moment to reinforce something that we talked about today that you can carry with you. And after I give you a moment to do that, I will pray for us all.